Bonjour, mesdames, messieurs, soyez bienvenus à notre symposium. What I'm going to talk about today is temperature monitoring and management, uh, but first a disclosure, 3M and a number of other companies interested in temperature regulation fund our department. Uh, however, I have no personal financial interest in anything that I'm going to mention today. I'm going to start with temperature monitoring. There are four reliable core temperature sites, the pulmonary artery, distal esophagus, nasopharynx, and tympanic membrane as measured with a thermocouple. That is a probe that you insert into the ear canal all the way until it hits the tympanic membrane. Those four sites are reliable. There are rarely differences of more than just a couple of tenths of a degree between those sites, and you can use any one of them interchangeably. The problem, of course, is that those sites are not always available. In intubated patients, it's easy. Esophageal temperature is reliable, it's resistant to artifact, and it's the obvious thing to measure in intubated patients. But in patients having neuraxial anesthesia or in patients having a laryngeal mask airway, it's not so easy to measure temperature. It's not so easy to measure temperature reliably postoperatively. However, there are some sites that are generally reliable. You have to select patients carefully, you have to insert the probes accurately, and you have to use good judgment about which patients you use them in, but the mouth, <coughs> axilla, and bladder are generally reliable sites. So those are alternatives. But then there are some sites that are not optimal and really don't work very well. One of them is forehead skin temperature, and I'm going to discuss skin temperature in some detail. But basically, skin temperature is not core temperature, and the difference between skin and core temperature varies considerably among individuals, and it varies within individuals over time. Infrared, so-called tympanic membrane thermometers, are not reliable. They, they really don't work very well. Some of you may remember this. this. This was a cover picture from anesthesia and analgesia. And if you look up here, you can see the casino icons. And the reason they're there is that these devices are essentially random number generators. They're, they're essentially useless. Uh, study after study shows that they don't work. And the same applies for these infrared temporal artery scanning thermometers. They are also approximately random number generators. Rectal temperature does not work very well either. It's um, different from core temperature, and most importantly, there is a much longer lag time than you would think. And so when core temperature changes quickly, rectal temperature doesn't, and you simply end up with the wrong value. The problem, well, actually, there are three problems with skin temperature. And the first of them is that hypothermia triggers thermoregulatory vasoconstriction. Vasoconstriction decreases blood flow by a factor of a 10 or a factor of 100. I mean, there, there's a huge decrease in blood flow to the arteria venous shunts, smaller decreases over the rest of the body. <laughs> Now, vasoconstriction is very effective. Vasoconstriction is what causes the core temperature plateau once people vasoconstrict. So from a thermoregulatory perspective, it is a useful, important, protective response, but it does so at the cost of decreasing skin blood flow, and that has a consequence of changing skin temperature. And we see that here. So these are basically three thermoregulatory states, and the difference between core and forehead temperature varies over time. Actually, it varies with the state. So that's the first problem with skin temperature, is that it's sensitive to thermoregulatory vasoconstriction. The second problem is that it's sensitive to ambient temperature. So this simply shows the difference between core 
and forehead skin temperature. So this is uncorrected skin temperatures, thermocouple on the forehead. And you can see it's a strong function of ambient temperature over the range of ambient temperatures that are experienced in operating rooms. So operating rooms warm up during surgery. You put people and equipment in them. It's perfectly normal to have a two degree increase in ambient temperature. And that influences the difference between core and skin temperature. So that's the second reason that skin temperature is unreliable. The third reason is that it does not respond to um, malignant hyperthermia. So malignant hyperthermia is a relatively rare condition, but undoubtedly one of the reasons to measure core temperature is to facilitate detecting this rare and potentially lethal complication. <coughs> this is a pig study, actually, and at time zero here, we triggered um, malignant hyperthermia in the swine by giving halothane and succinylcholine. And you can see that esophageal temperature increases very quickly, and it increases a lot. So if you were following esophageal temperature here, you would immediately detect that there was something seriously wrong, and you would start looking at end tidal CO2 and for rash and rigidity and other signs of malignant hyperthermia. <laughs> but suppose you were following rectal temperature. Look what happens. Nothing happens for a while and then it goes down. This is not helpful, folks. <laughs> okay, so rectal temperature just completely fails. Well, you know what? It wasn't just rectal temperature. Skin temperature also failed. And the reason it fails is that malignant hyperthermia triggers a huge increase in norepinephrine. Norepinephrine, epinephrine concentrations go up by factor 20 during malignant hyperthermia. You get skin vasoconstriction. That vasoconstriction is enough to compensate for the increase in core temperature. So core temperature goes up. You get more heat coming from the core, except that it's blocked by vasoconstriction, and the amount of heat that's leaving into the room is enough so that skin temperature never goes up. So this is the third problem with skin temperature, but you see it's also a major problem with rectal temperature. So uncompensated skin temperature is not a good way to measure core temperature. Let's see if I can make this work. Okay. There is a way, though, to make skin temperature reliable. And the distinction I'm making here is between uncompensated skin temperature and something called zero heat flux thermometry. This is not a new concept. This concept dates to the 40s. It, it was invented by Fox. It's been refined by others since then. It's a, a well-established but not very well-known technique. What it consists of is putting an insulator over the skin and then putting a little heater over the insulator. Then you can put an insulator on top of the heater if you want, that part's optional. If you do that, you can then servo control the heater so that the top of the insulator and the bottom of the insulator have exactly the same temperature. So this just requires a little electric circuit, servo control the heater, and you control it until the top and the bottom have the same temperature. The second law of thermodynamics says that heat can only flow down a temperature gradient. So if the temperature is at the same at the top and the bottom of an insulator, there is zero flow. So that's what I mean by zero heat flux thermometry. There's, by definition, no flow of heat at that point. Okay, so then what happens? What happens is that if there is no flow of heat here, there actually can't be any flow of heat just below that either. So you have no flow of heat into this insulator, but you have no flow in the tissue right under it. And you have no flow in the tissue right under that either. 
And so what you end up with is a little tunnel going into the core. Now, this is not exactly true because there can be lateral convection of heat. So blood flow going laterally can take heat out of this little tunnel. But it turns out it's not a big effect. And so in practice, you end up with a tunnel here that goes down about a centimeter, maybe two centimeters. So under these conditions, temperature there is actually equal to temperature one to two centimeters below the core. So you get an isothermal tunnel, and at that point, skin temperature is equal to core temperature so long as the thermometer system is put someplace where the core is only a centimeter or two below the skin surface. And the forehead is a good example of that. If you drill one centimeter into the forehead, you're, you're well into the core, you're, you're in the bone. If you go in two centimeters, you're in the brain. So this is a good core temperature. And it turns out it doesn't take very long. It, it takes a, a few minutes for this system to heat up and go from normal skin temperature to this isothermal tunnel that gives you core temperature. This approach is well validated. As I said, it was invented in the 40s. It's, it's extremely well validated. Lots of people have tested this, including us on many occasions. So this was a test we did um, many years ago with a device uh, manufactured by Terumo. Um, and it shows that it's highly reliable. So there, there was no bias and the distribution is quite small. Um, the limitation here is that Terumo's device is only available in Japan. Um, so this is a really nice system, but it's not unfortunately widely available at the moment. I'd like to go on now and talk about how to keep people warm. So a Andrea gave you some background in physiology and explained why people get cold. And to summarize it in two sentences, people get cold because anesthetics impair thermoregulatory control. And without thermoregulatory control, people in a cold operating room become hypothermic. Simple enough. And Andrea also explained that hypothermia has a lot of adverse effects. In fact, the adverse effects of hypothermia are better documented than a whole lot of things in medicine. Basically, there are a whole series of randomized trials um, that document these outcomes. And, and these were major studies. They were, they were published in New England Journal, Lancet, JAMA, et cetera. So, the consequences of hypothermia are serious, and we are not talking about cardiac levels of hypothermia. What we're talking about is, say, one and a half degrees of hypothermia. This is the amount of hypothermia that every one of your patients is going to get if they're not actively warmed. So how do you keep them warm? Well, the easiest way to reduce heat loss in perioperative patients, in surgical patients, is to cover them with an insulator. And every operating room has bunches of insulators in them, ranging from plastic bags, cotton blankets, various sorts of operating room drapes, and space blankets. Do they work? Yes, they work. Each of these reduces heat loss by about 30%. And a 30% reduction in heat loss is a clinically important amount. Note, though, that there is no important difference among these insulators. Do not pay extra for a space blanket because it hardly works better than a plastic <coughs> bag. The reason is that it's not actually the insulator that prevents the heat loss. What prevents the heat loss is that little layer of still air between the insulator and the patient. And therefore, it doesn't matter what the cover is. All that matters is that you produce that little bit of still air. So insulators work well. They reduce heat loss by 30%. If that is sufficient to keep your patients normothermic, 
that's all you need to do. The trouble is that it rarely is. It's true that a 30% reduction is clinically important, but it's not enough to keep people normal thermic. It's not enough to compensate for redistribution <laughs> hypothermia. So you might think, okay, great. One layer reduces heat loss by 30%. I'm gonna put on three layers and reduce heat loss by 90%. Unfortunately, the thermodynamics doesn't work that way. So um, going from one layer to three layers does uh, increase the efficacy. It reduces heat loss from 30% to say 50%, but that's not a very big change at this point, even though you've added two more covers. So if one layer is keeping your patients warm, that's great. If it's not, simply adding a couple of more layers isn't gonna help. And by the way, it makes almost no difference whether you use warmed or unwarmed covers. Patients love warm blankets. That's a good reason to use warm blankets, but warm blankets don't have any appreciable heat capacity. Um, it's not actually changing the amount of heat loss. So if covers aren't helping, you're gonna have to switch to something else. And what you will probably switch to is forced air. Forced air is by far and away the most common active warming system worldwide. It's highly, highly effective, far more effective than circulating water. Now, there are other effective systems that are available, but forced air has a really nice combination of being effective, easy to use, safe. Um, it's just a, a good way to go, and so that, that's what most people do use. Recently, there's been con some concern that forced air disturbs laminar flow systems. Uh, the theory is that warm air released near the patient produces an upwards current that interferes with a downward or a sideways laminar flow system so we did a, a fairly formal evaluation of that, and it turns out that it doesn't. It, it's simply not true that the number of particles, and, and these are artificial sterile particles that are released for test purposes, um, at baseline is very high. By definition, we were spewing these out into the room, um, but without air, or with ambient air, with warm air, it doesn't make any difference. Um, forced air warming does not interfere with laminar flow. And what I mean by that is that these three columns have about the same height, and it is all way, way below the European threshold for efficacy of laminar flow systems. And then finally, I want to talk, not finally, but I want to talk about fluid warming. Fluid warming is never your first line treatment for hypothermia. It's never your first line therapy because most patients don't get enough fluid to make a difference. You cannot warm patients by warming fluid. The reason is that you can't warm the fluid to very much above core temperature. On the other hand, you absolutely can cool patients by giving large volumes of cold fluid. And the amount of cooling is absolutely predictable from thermodynamics. You don't need to do a study. It's very simple. It's a quarter of a degree per liter of crystalloid in a 70 kilogram patient. A unit of blood in a 70 kilogram patient decreases mean body temperature by exactly the same amount, a quarter of a degree. The reason is that it's half the volume and it's twice as cold. So there is no logic in giving, say, five liters of crystalloid at ambient temperature and then hooking up a fluid warmer to give one unit of blood. If you are giving large amounts of fluid, use a fluid warmer. If you are not giving large amounts of fluid, whether or not blood is included, do not bother with a fluid warmer. And by substantial amount of fluid, I would say at least one liter per hour. 
and fluid warming is always a secondary response. Okay, so use some sort of active warming system first. That's to compensate for redistribution hypothermia to keep your patient warm. Then fluid warming you add if you are giving large amounts of fluid only. I would like to talk a little bit about the surgical um, care improvement project known as SKIP in the United States. Uh, this is now a national mandate. Payment in the United States is now linked to SKIP compliance. So in the United States, the use of, of warming and temperature monitoring has become essentially universal. So to qualify for this measure, that is, who is in <coughs> the measure? Whom do we have to report to the government about? It's patients having surgery. It, it doesn't apply if you're doing anesthesia for a non-surgical procedure. It applies to patients having general or neuraxial anesthesia. Note that there is no exclusion for epidural or spinal anesthesia. We need to measure the temperature and report it and keep these patients normothermic just like we do for general anesthesia. And the reason is that patients having neuraxial anesthesia are not protected from any of the complications that Andrea described. They are just as likely to have them. And as she mentioned, patients having neuraxial anesthesia become just as hypothermic as patients having general anesthesia. And if a patient is having intentional hypothermia, which includes bypass, then they are excluded. But basically, this is all patients having a surgical procedure, neuraxial or general anesthesia for at least an hour, are in the measure. And then how do you meet it? You can meet the measure best by being normothermic. And you can be normothermic either just before the end of surgery or just after the end of surgery. The other way you can meet it is by using an active overbody warming system. So it's a combination of a process that is a warming technique and an outcome that is temperature measure. And you can meet it either way. You can meet it by using an approved process so active overbody warming, or by having your patient normothermic by whatever means you choose. So what's the conclusion here? Is we've given you now many reasons to monitor core temperature and to keep your patients normothermic. You really need to measure core temperature. If you don't measure the core temperature, you simply won't know what's happening to your patients, but I promise you, they are getting hypothermic if you are not actively warming them. And you need to maintain normothermia because we have shown you that hypothermia causes many complications. How you keep patients normothermic is entirely up to you. You can't imagine how little I care what methods you use to keep patients normothermic. Whatever you are doing that works is fine. If your patients are normothermic, that's great. Most people in the world use forced air, certainly what we use at the Cleveland Clinic. Um, it's a very nice combination of efficacy, safety, cost, and ease of use. But really, whatever you use is absolutely fine with me but there is overwhelming evidence that hypothermia is harmful. You owe it to your patients to keep them normothermic. Thank you much. <laughs>